please share with us what are the things that you are most concerned about as it relates to the way the pandemic and social injustice intersect? Thank you, Melissa. I think one of the things that I'm most concerned about as a clinician is the emotional psychological impact of everything that has been happening over the last few months and more specifically within the last few weeks. Uh, what we're seeing right now is a rising of social unrest that the, the truth of it is, is these concerns have been present for years, for generations. But because of what happened with COVID, where we were all sequestered in our homes and we were seeing social media and that was our only escape to the outside world. And then having everything happen beginning even before uh, the tragedy with George Floyd, we're seeing a lot of stress, we're seeing a lot of anxiety, we're seeing a lot of distress and very limited ways to express those emotions. Absolutely. And there have been so many experiences of, of injustice happening daily and that this situation places a magnifying lens on all of these injustices. And so we have an opportunity to explore the way it's impacting us psychologically. Uh, not only uh, the health, the physical health, matters and the financial impact, but also the psychological impact. Makisha, would you like to add to this, to this part of the conversation? Um, I think as Eugenia said, it, you know, there, it's, um, it's a snowball effect, right? So there's, it's generally not one thing. It's typically a combination of things. It's a, a statement that I tip, that I use from you, Marisa, which is a, a combo effect um, in terms of, you know, some of the frustrations and feelings of isolation and stress regarding um, the pandemic, but then also those feelings of stress and isolation regarding um, feeling like there's been limited progress or um, a devolvement of um, progress in terms of what's happening for people socially. So I do feel like that's something that we, we that I'm finding um, typically with clients as well. Mm -hmm. A sense of devolvement. That's a powerful statement. And in times of chaos, we may, we may feel uh, as if all this unraveling represents uh, moving backwards as opposed to forward. And yet one thing that we're learning and we have all had conversations about privately, there's something about chaos that when we step back to look at it and catch a panoramic view of it, there's, there's beauty, there's opportunities for form forward movement, for shifts to happen. And, and part of the process uh, involves increasing awareness. On many platforms, definitely in the academic context. So I'm wondering, Blaine, what you would like to add about the role of the educator in this process of developing awareness. Oh, I want to thank you, first of all, um, and I feel honored to be the only male on this panel of wonderful female leadership. Um, and to be invited to this conversation is a tremendous honor for me. Um, so you, I heard this, this idea of injustice. And the first thing I thought about it is that is injustice is institutional in, yes. in, our, in, our current, in our current situation and what we're living. And, it's, and injustice is generational, not just institutional, but it's generational. Mm -hmm. and, the two, and the two crises that we're living right now and our contemporary lived experience is COVID-19, right? And also the race crisis in our country. And I would say within COVID-19 from an educator lens, um, the, 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 the struggles that we have is the lack of access uh, to technology, uh, lack of access to school because school over the past 30, 40, maybe 50 years now has taken on a whole new responsibility. It's no longer just an educational center. It is a social center where people can access um, um, information and means basically to life, 
Um, also, we're dealing with this idea of fear. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you mitigate um, feelings of fear in the community, um, whether it's related to immigration, whether it's related to COVID-19, right? There's a lot of fear um, and not being able to trust the system and the system that's, that, that's supposed to be established to protect um, the students that and the parents, right, that we serve. And the second institutional injustice is around race and really relating to um, education, it's around identity. Right now we're living in a, not just a race crisis, but an identity crisis. A lot of, a lot of um, not just um, youth, but also young adults, millennials, and also people who are a little bit older are struggling with their, their responsibility to their, to their own culture. Also, we understand that the curriculum in schools has not, today is Juneteenth, let's honor that. Right. Today, Juneteenth, Juneteenth. And, you know, it's a, it's a celebration, commemoration of slavery ending in the United States of America. But I will say that this is the very first time that people are talking across the country about Juneteenth. Juneteenth. And it's not something that's embedded to in, in the curriculum in our schools. Right. Because ethnic studies and just the history curriculum is not talking about Juneteenth as a celebratory date. Right. Um, and then also the idea on crisis around government, government as an education, education as a government institution is not protecting the rights of people to their race. It's not teaching people about the race and supporting people and edifying their race. So those are two major issues that we're facing right now. Again, to summarize COVID-19 crisis and then race crisis and our responsibility and struggles as educators. Absolutely. Thank you for making sure that we highlight the fact that this conversation is taking place on Juneteenth. Right. This is a time in history when more of the country and the world is becoming better aware mm -hmm. of the history that has intentionally been covered. Right. It is an example of systematic oppression. The Gloria Latson Billings talks a lot about the fact that everybody talks about the academic achievement gap and the fact that our students are not meeting, you know, some of the standards that are out there. But she also highlights that it's so much more than that. It's about all of the other gaps that people don't talk about, like the health gap, yeah. the education opportunity gap, the economic gap, the housing gap. There are so many gaps. Uh, and this situation we've been in in the last few months has highlighted those those big divides that are getting bigger and bigger every year, uh, where fewer and fewer people are in charge of all the money that is made, for example, in this country, and, and less and less of the people um, from minoritized groups and even what was the middle class are having access to, to the goods and services and opportunities so it becomes even more severe in our communities of color. And so I think right now it's put a lens on everything. And this situation, as you mentioned earlier, with regard to how children and teachers might be feeling is exacerbated when, you know, we've had this technological divide and teachers are being asked to teach children in a way that they've not done before. Uh, professors are being asked in many cases to, you know, to teach in ways they've never done before. And parents are being asked to play a role in teaching in ways that they've never done before. Did, and then there might not even be the possibility of having the tools at home to do that kind of learning online. So we, we have a, a, a serious situation. I mean, I think when when Blaine talks about a crisis, it is a crisis. We we are in a crisis, and um, everybody's worried about getting out there and getting the economy going. But until we really look at what's happening and deal with some of these areas, and and do some major shift, shifting and planning to improve and to redistribute the kind of wealth that's made and to, to provide better health care and better opportunities and better access to all of these areas, we're, we're, we're going to keep going down into uh, some places that we've never been before, perhaps. And I think it's putting a lot of pressure on, on everyone. For teachers, I think it's being prepared mentally and also in terms of their own training on how to be, for example, to learn the history of the United States and be able to teach it wholly, not to 
have these selections of what is American history and then to leave out whole, ga whole pieces um, for the sake of a narrative that isn't even real. It's not really a, a, our history. It's like a, a false history. So I think now everybody's sort of getting online with, wow, we got some major changes to do in policing. We got major changes to do in teaching. We have major, we have some big, a lot of work to do in, in this country. Speaking of the financial aspect of this, Maritza, from a, a perspective of life in the business world, what would you recommend that we keep in mind? We all, not only the business people, have to keep in mind, like um, Ligia said, we're all being challenged. I think there's also a great opportunity for learning new things and realizing that you can do more than you thought or what you have. You know, this is definitely a state of change. Uh, in the business world, we've seen companies that had full buildings with people working, and now those people are working from home. Uh, some companies didn't consider telework, um, working from home, an option, but now they were found that they had to do it, and, and it's working. But, you know, sometimes they had to update their equipment, but it's doable. And thank God people had, had that option because they could still work. Companies that are flexible and nimble and able to change their strategy and the way they do work are the ones that have been adjusting the best at this pandemic, like, you know, working from home. Or we also saw in the case of at the beginning of the pandemic that some of the companies, like a beauty company, instead of making makeup, they made gel, antiseptic gel, because it was needed. Community, collaboration. And we saw restaurants that at the beginning of the pandemic, when we couldn't get food because people were just buying it up, they were selling the provisions uh, to help themselves and to help the community. You know, you couldn't find it in the grocery store, you could find it at this place. So I think um, we've all learned new things. We've learned that we could do different and different doesn't mean bad. Um, and that collaboration works and helps everybody in the long run. I look at this as a time where it's cleaning, cleansing, for example, with the COVID virus, I have never in my life seen so many people clean as much as we have been cleaning. So, <laughs> you know, and I was watching TV and they were cleaning the subway in New York and they're cleaning the metro in LA. So a time of cleansing, not only for the outside world, but for us. I look at this as hope. Um, we have an opportunity now to write that what was wrong. For example, we have um, in our history books, now we can tell our story. We can add it to the books where before we didn't have that hope. Uh, Black Lives Matter is now around the world, even in our Latin countries. My wanting here, my need for people to, to read, for people to investigate is urgent. It is really urgent. They have no idea of all that we have gone through. They have no idea of our journey. So many years of suffering. People need to read, people need to investigate, people need to nourish yourself with the history. And then, only then, we might come to peace. I think um, something that we talked about prior to airing, which is, um, that the, the concept of America, um, it's a wonderful concept, um, and it uh, is a concept that is, um, is seen uh, in some people's lives, but is aspirational in the lives of other people. And um, I think that's the part that's difficult for um, the people who experience the, the so-called promise or have experienced some, aspect of, some aspects of the them to um, to understand is that for for many people um, that concept has not uh, been fulfilled in the same way um, and I think what uh, all this what our, our vocalization right now um, is really around you know humans just want other someone else to bear witness that I don't need you to feel guilty. I need you to bear witness. I need you to not look away. I need you to acknowledge. I need you to, to know that um, these are um, 
parts of your history as well as as ours. Um, and uh, looking away is also looking away from your history. Um, so that's that's kind of the, what I was thinking about. Thank you. Loretta, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are, you know, um, anti-Black racism has been around. That it, it started in this country um, centuries ago. And we're still looking at the after effects of slavery. Um, it's in the complex trauma that most Black people experience, um, whether they're aware of it or not. It comes through intergenerationally. Um, it's been proven that you can pass on trauma through uh, reproduction, um, both through the mother and the father's genes. Um, and so when you have those layering, uh, the, the multi-layers of, of trauma, and you add it to the fact that African Americans' history started on this in, in this land, um, that there was a total disconnect from uh, Africa, where their original people came from. Um, you have a you have a, a, a one population of indigenous people that have no origin other than here, so they don't have the the richness of ancestral ground to um, stand on and to be proud of. And so it's like Makisha said, if you have no uh, one witnessing, bearing witness to the fact that you've had these atrocities happen throughout your experience and life in this, in this land, and it just goes on without ever being acknowledged, mm -hmm. it is just um, a continuous travesty. We are still facing some of the exact same things, as you said, happened in 1852. It happened in the 1500s. It, it's happening in 2020, where there is a total disregard and a dehumanization of Black people. And um, no one wants to stand up and be counted and say, we're sorry that happened. Today, we have a, a, an opportunity to to really unpack how this pain that moves from one generation to the next, how it manifests in our daily lives. Yeah, yeah, so I think uh, uh, experientially um, and in, in my own family and then also working with clients is a lot of things come up somatically. So there, you know, um, we have uh, lots of um, headaches, back aches, stomach aches, um, fatigue. Um, uh, I don't know how many times I've heard, I don't have no reason to be tired. Um, but there's not a concrete reason in the forefront, but, um, but you know, that kind of um, passing along of that fatigue is, is evident in, um, in many of us. Um, as you said, we are very good at surviving. Um, uh, thriving too at some points, but I think that um, I think that we think that survival is thriving, um, and so I think that that's sometimes hard to translate that um, that they're not the same thing, um, and that if you are experiencing chronic fatigue, is that really thriving? Mm -hmm. um, I think the other ways are you know just in kind of that these ways in which fear play a role in us um, uh, as part of our adaptive um, processing of uh, protection. Um, and so fear uh, comes up in lots of different ways. Um, you know, they can come up as an anxiety disorder, quote unquote, um, but if we think about some ways in which we were raised, then um, it would make sense that you'd have some hypervigilance uh, with regard to how you navigate. So. I'm so glad that you mentioned, uh, in quotes, these diagnoses, because something that uh, we, are, we are discussing more frequently, and I'm thankful for it, uh, not only in, 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 the, in the world of clinical work, but otherwise, because healing uh, can be facilitated by an interdisciplinary approach, as opposed to uh, expecting this to be facilitated only by uh, clinicians. Um, so I'm glad that this discourse 
about questioning diagnoses is coming up more frequently. If there isn't enough exploration of someone's history, uh, so, so quickly, uh, someone can jump to a diagnosis that has, has no true um, description of what's happening with, with a person, be it a child or an adult. So I, I'm really glad that, you know, we're questioning these diagnoses and, and not being married to labels without exploring cultural and historical context, you know. May, may there be more uh, diverse professionals at the table when these diagnostic books are re-released. Well, I think it speaks to the, the unconscious collective uh, mind. Um, and, and so basically, um, you know, when we, when we consider what we've all been through um, and our ancestors have gone through, uh, I think when you look at it as a collective uh, unconscious, you you realize that most people aren't even aware where the pain comes from. So it's in the body and the body is trying to speak to us. We often dismiss that because we dismiss a lot of things that are negative um, that we don't want to face. Um, you know, it's, it's not for us to complain, those types of things. Um, and so the more we do that, the more intense the pain grows. And that's how we pass it on to other people because the pain turns into aggravation. You know, when you look at the, um, you continue to look at how slavery has affected uh, black people and, 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 and other indigenous people where there's been a profound effect of slavery or enslavement, um, you see that, um, people turn that into them, they turn it onto themselves. So it becomes internalized racism, right? So that also is from fear, fear of being other, fear of being dismissed as other or being invisible. So if we're constantly trying to be seen and trying to be heard, we're going to more than likely attempt to assimilate uh, into that um, dominant culture as much as we can so that we can then be whole, which is false, that's not what makes us whole, but that is the assumption. It's, it's in the way we're taught when we're told as little kids, you know, get a good education and you can do anything with your life. Well, that's true for some. And that is, a, that is an American model that is based on dominant cultures, expectations of their children. We are simply trying to follow that model that does not fit our lives in the same way. So we can be educated people and it doesn't matter what level of education you have or socioeconomic standing you have, you are still looked at as other. And so that, that otherness is what, where the tiredness comes from because you're constantly fighting against being other. That's part of where the tiredness comes from. Um, the hypervigilance that you talked about, Makita, that, that is so prevalent in, in all of us because we're constantly trying to make sure that we're safe. Is this a safe space for me to be myself? And what does that look like? Anytime there is any level of awareness, any level of protest, the oppressor needs to up the ante, right? And so these systems become ever more sophisticated to oppress us. So they're, so they're surviving some type of fear if they have this need to up the ante. So it, does, does this suggest that there are two sides to this survival coin, ours and theirs, every time they have to up the ante with the stories they tell themselves and move down generations, just like our pain moves down generations? And uh, I, I found very interesting that this amazing, brilliant author, James Baldwin, left us with words that still apply today in 2020. And, and I want to, to share this, and I'm curious about your thoughts on how this may be uh, a way of unpacking 
what the oppressor continues to tell themselves in order to survive the fear of our liberation. And James Baldwin said this, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. I'm so thankful, Melissa, that you invited me to be a part of this because as these other two beautiful artists share, you all are inspiring me. And it's a, 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 um, it's a sense of strengthening and reorganizing mm -hmm. and no, re-energizing so that I yeah. can reorganize yeah. if I need to reorganize. And it's like these things sometimes they come along and we don't even think about it until it happens. And then we know it's supposed to be happening. It's like, that's what God wanted me to have today to help me to move along in the way that I need to move along from this point on. It's, it's, given, it's, it's given me energy to know that there's still hope for me, you know, to can you continue to do this. And then even if I may share this about kids, um, Something happened recently with my, my, my granddaughter. She's seven and a half and she got a cold. You know, she'd gone, gotten food, got um, chilled. She got a cold and when she gets cold, she gets a stuffy nose and it's hard for her to breathe. And so uh, she was, I was on the phone talking to my daughter, her mom, and she was, you know, telling me that she had a cold. And so my granddaughter started to cry. And so I could hear my daughter and her mom say, why are you crying? And she says, I don't want to be sick. I don't want to be sick. I said, you're going to get better. And so my daughter was telling me that she was so upset because she said, I don't want to get, I don't want to have to quarantine for 14 days and, 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 and not be around my family. And she's seven and a half. And it was like, wow, we're going through this. Just imagine what the children are going through. And then what your students are going through is just like, so I think that we all have a tool to help the world, all of us. And, 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 it's, and it's our job to do that. It's our calling to do that. And if all of us who will have that power and tool come together, that's what's going to make a difference. Because right now, there is no turning back. Mm -mm. And I feel that something great is getting ready to come out, is coming out of what we're going through right now. Amen. And, and, I believe it. And I, I believe it. I think this is a turning point like no other. Um, I wanted to share, Melissa, she, as Melissa shared with you, we've collaborated in the past and continue. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit about Echo with them. You know, um, this piece that I have um, actually was my thesis piece at CalArts a few years back, but has since been performed and it's a piece again calling echo but it looks at the ramifications of the Atlantic slave trade and how it reverberates and and again what are um, I was looking at the sort of the visceral um, experiences throughout and there's some there's an opening scene I don't know if you remember this Melissa the scene with the ancestors in a circle yeah. you know and so you, but we open up with the piece where in, in its live version, and I, and I say that because it's going to be transformed, but in its live theatrical version, where you literally enter into the space, I wanted to present this space of you being in the underwater, and immediately you're met with the ancestors who, who didn't necessarily make it, you know, so whose bodies and spirits are still in the Atlantic. And so I've been thinking about that a lot lately in terms of this, the, the, the reimagined version. I'm shifting this piece into a a virtual AR um, exp immersive experience. And I, so I've been trying to reimagine what would that look like being underwater with the ancestors in this moment? Mm -hmm. And the idea of them literally awakening and emerging from the bed of the earth under the water and the coral and the reef. And so this idea that when you talk about the shifts and what this, what's actually happening, 
I, I feel that that's what I'm, I'm feeling like a, this an emergence and their bodies are shifting and the earth is shifting and the movement of the water. I mean, so I wonder, my thought is, again, this awakening of their energy is causing all this, this, this whole entire rift, you know, um, and so trying to put a visual um, and again, theatrical immersive experience around that. That's, um, that is beautiful. Huh? I'm sorry. That's beautiful. <laughs> I, I saw that immediately it's such from, a from a cinematic standpoint in my head as a director. I saw that immediately. I saw that. That's beautiful. Mm. Powerful. So I'm working with um, a, a animator, VR person. And so again, we're, take, we're reimagining the live mm. version of this. Oh my God. So that way we can create a space where literally a participant, an audience member is inside of that experience. And, and so again, the body language of, you know, this breath of awakening. Um, so that's where, I'm, that's where I am right now. Again, so going back to the question, Melissa, what happens to dance? You know, I, I really feel like we're, I'm again, I'm in a, in a spot, I'm in a moment where I have to reimagine my art form, um, mm -hmm. you know, from the way that I'm used to engaging with it. So mm -hmm. I have to lean into other ways of expression with movement. You yeah. have seen it in the theater mm -hmm. was so powerful and the way you're describing this this reimagining of it i am mm -hmm. looking forward to, to that experience because uh just as you presented it before it was incredibly powerful mm -hmm. uh very emotional very emotional um, and uh, thank all of you for, for, for the, the work that you do. Will you say then, and, and, and any of you, please jump in. Would you say that um, the ancestors are making, are giving us the energy that we need today so that uh, transformation, not just mere change, transformation of this world uh, unfolds. There's something about this year that I just, wow. What I feel like it's a new movement, like the Renaissance era when it came through, I think for the arts. There's something new that's being created right now. That's right. Oh, it, it's, I can't explain this. It. Really, right. It's getting goosebumps right now. And I think that uh, we as artists are very strong people. <laughs> and, and I think that because of that and, and the whole spirituality with our art, that is helping us move through these challenges that we have that we've never been up against. Uh, in the way that we're up against, and there's a new movement. When people look back on history, they're going to look back on this time, and they're going to see and know how whatever that movement is going to be called in the future came about, and it's going to be about now, and it's mm -hmm. going to be about us. Cherie, mm -hmm. to me, I go along 110,000% with you. It feels like this is another reconstruction period mm. for me. Mm. This, is, this is the crossroad again that we've come to in mankind where we have to make the, the, the right decision because if we don't make the right decision this time, we won't be able to come back until this mm. probably another 40 or 50 years from now. So everything depends on making the right spiritual fed, led decisions now. This is why we are so important. The artist is so important right now because we have this time that we asked to be here in this time to be a part of the reconstruction of humankind. This is our time to redefine change the narrative, own the narrative, if you wish. 
if you wish. Everything that's ever been done in America has led to this point. There's a very good reason why we're here. All of us. There's a very good reason why we have the gifts we have right now. And what are we going to do with them? At this crossroads, it's an important spiritual time. Wow, that was a pretty amazing experience to, to watch again. And I, I thank everyone who participated in, in those uh, excerpts that were shared. There were many more pretty powerful conversations. And it was such a challenge to pull from each because so much wisdom was shared. And so um, I am looking forward to, to your reflections. So what were your thoughts about the different things that were shared in, in uh, these clips from our, from our episodes? Well, the first thing that jumped out at me, I'm sorry to that's okay, go ahead. But uh, the first thing that jumped out at me was that in the midst of chaos, there's always some type of beauty to be found. Mm -hmm. Now, I choose to see that there's joy no matter what, even though everything that happens to us is not going to be good. And there's things that are, that are happening this year that are completely beyond our control. Um, we have to be present and know that it's okay to feel how we feel about those things. And it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with us, but there's a, there's a chance for us as an artist to see the moment for what it is and to create what I want that reality to look like on the other side of this. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you, Joyce. Joyce is a filmmaker that has brought so much wisdom to these conversations. And I think here's an opportunity to have uh, uh, a quick go around of all the beautiful people on the screen. Joyce Thomas being a filmmaker. Kay Benjamin, please wave. An actor mm -hmm. who is part of uh, Joyce's uh, documentary, The Rhythm of Blue. Kimiko Warner Turner, please wave. <laughs> also a, a theater educator. Maritza Collins business, creative, you name it. <laughs> Bridget Dunn Corpila, dancer, choreographer, please wave. We have also Adila Dr. D. Whitaker, psychologist, and, and her beautiful baby joining us today. <laughs> and we have psychologist, Carla Michelle, who's also a business coach, uh, educator, industrial engineer, Ligia Greno, joining us from Panama, and clinicians, William Haddad and Loretta Brazil. What a group we have. And I thank you all for being a part of, of this series that we all feel compelled to put together to join the world in reflecting. And uh, we're now joined by another lovely clinician, a uh, part of the Pacific Oaks family, Susan Love. All Hello. Right. <laughs> Welcome. So, Joyce kicked us off with a reflection on uh, the challenges and opportunities of this year. Who, who else would like to jump in with reflections? Carla. Uh, first, I want to just give you kudos for mm -hmm. gathering such meaty, meaty information and feedback mm -hmm. and taking the time. It, if anyone does what she does, you know it's not a simple feat. It is something that 
takes energy and time and talent amongst the other 50,000 things that you do, Melissa. So kudos to you to grab the moment and the conversation and to bring people in and collaborate and not just do it on your own, but hear other voices and, and just seeing that that uh, clips, those clips, it, it just, in December to where we look back at March and April and May and June mm -hmm. and see, we still got a lot of work to do. <laughs> we still got a lot of work to do, but at least there was something happening. Um, I really feel that, um, gosh, we need to play this as often just to remind us of wh mm -hmm. what we've done. And I've come to realize that we can use this as a cloak, something heavy on us, or we can use this time as a cape mm. and really use it to impact and, and do some supernatural, super wonderful, awesome things. And um, that's what I'm taking away from this year. I, you know, losing my dad, not to COVID, but in the midst of it, not having a proper funeral, you know, because of COVID and losing an uncle from complications from COVID just a couple of weeks ago and having loved ones affected by COVID. And then, you know, it's almost taken away from Black Lives Matter in some sense, but has it, you know, because then we are mostly affected in experiencing the care, not getting the care that we need, but just to really staying vigilant. And so thank you for reminding us of our strength and our power and our creativity and seeing the talents that we carry. It is just amazing. The artists, the, you know, the, t the therapists, the psychologists, the, all the people represented here today. And so it's just an honor to be a part of this. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for, for showing us, you know, who we are even more so on a, a broader level. Well, I thank you for your kind words. I just have to say that, you know, being, being surrounded, being part of a community of of people with such diverse uh, forms of expertise, um, I just felt that here was an opportunity for us to be activists through, through sharing our thoughts, our observations, inviting people into reflection by hearing a wide range of perspectives with, with so much expertise on this screen alone, and, and definitely uh, all the other people who were able to participate and, and sometimes participate multiple times, mm -hmm. I am just so thankful and I feel blessed to be a part of this community. I feel that this year has really invited us to recognize the power of our gifts and to not sit on them. I love your metaphor, cloak versus cape. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this down. I love it. I love it. We're here to inspire ourselves, each other. And, and this year, I mean, if nothing else, I hope this year tells us, listen, don't sit on your gifts, amplify them. The world needs it. It's urgent. It's urgent. So I I thank you all. I thank you, Carla, for being a part of this and all the things that you do. Everybody in, everybody in this group does delicious stuff. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> ah. Melissa, I wanted to add to that. Thank you, Carla. Mm -hmm. That was nice, too. Um, I, I wanted to add to that because as I was listening and reflecting on the session that we had, I was thinking about um, this year and how it's been an exposure of the collective global othering and othering meaning the injustice and the, the uh, of identity and cultural complexes and um, uh, you know thinking about the fact that it, it's never it's hardly ever talked about but black lives began before slavery mm -hmm. right. and how we still haven't really got to the point of talking about that um, in this country and even in the world. It's a, it's a global experience for Black people to now be recognized and to stand up and show their identity and be proud of the fact that they are who they are as opposed to always being um, othered in the sense of, of loss of identity, of, of culture, of experience, of just being invisible in the world. Um, 
And it doesn't seem to matter how much there's been contribution by Black people. It's always been something that has been kind of pushed away and um, not shown. So I think in this year, with with COVID in particular, I think it's given people time to sit down and reflect and to see and to, to appear in their own lives and see how they matter and see what's important and how we do connect to one another and, and how it has to be um, an exchange that everyone participates in in order for something to come about that is called change. Yes. So I think that that's what I take away from this year is that it has been that. We've had a lot of time to ourselves and, and to very few and having intimate times for conversation um, such as the conversation that we had and the impact that it has on just a, the, the scale across the world. Yeah. So that's what I take away from this year. And I thank you for the opportunity to be able to be a part of it um, and to be in the collective that is talking about it. Thank you. You are so welcome. I'm thankful that, that you uh, in, 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 in your participation shared with the world what multi-generational pain looks like. It's important that those of us who've been immersed in learning about certain things, we share with the world, you know, what, what, what that looks like so that, so that people may sit with it and, and recognize, oh, that's how come I've been having these backaches. Uh, here's background information for these back aches, you know, and, and to hear you and Makisha explain it, I was so glad to see that uh, because so many of us have not had an opportunity to learn about these things. Yeah, I think, I think Makisha and I were kindred spirits that day. We just kind of were able to join in such a way I'd never met her before. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was just a beautiful experience to to share that and with my background in depth psychology, um, you know, to talk about the, the archetypal type things that come up that we never, again, you know, talk about. So, yeah, there was such beautiful synergy in all of the groups that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would love to invite you, Bridget, uh, to, to share your, your thoughts as an artist, especially because I know that uh, you won't be able to stay with us uh, for very long. But before you start, we've been joined by Pastor Kelvin Sauls, uh, who has been such uh, an active person in the community supporting this movement of Black Lives Matter, inviting us all into community service in, in the best way that we can with uh, physical distancing. I don't want to call it social distancing. Physical distancing that allows us to do the work in community. Pastor Sauls uh, is uh, from South Africa, but I think he thinks he's Afro-Latino, but I digress. <laughs> Hola. Hola. <laughs> All right, Bridget, please jump in. Um, again, so I, 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 first of all, thank you, Melissa, and I apologize that I have to be so brief because actually I have a production meeting for the project that I was referencing. Um, but um, so again, it is an honor to be a part of this group to have actually participated and be in these conversations with you um, and, and with others, even from a distance. Um, so my takeaway, um, I almost, it's interesting listening to myself. Um, and what I want to say, I almost feel like I'm still still processing that, but I'm in the throes of working again on this piece. Um, it's called Echo Now Immersive Experience. But again, it, looking at the ramifications of the Atlantic slave trade, but a lot of it is we're approaching it again with how are we, um, how are we living and navigating the embodied trauma? So the conversation that, 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 that keeps coming up. And so as a movement-based artists, that is the, the realm in which I, I live and explore um, with my, my collaborators and the dancers. And, um, 
you know, and again, and even with students. And so the thing is, the question is, how do we, how do we embark upon that journey, looking at what's embodied, what's living inside our, our, our own, this vessel, you know, I, I refer to this body as this vessel. Um, and depending on the vessel you were assigned, or, or, and or it, 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 I think it then has ramifications on your experience. And so as black and brown bodies, our experiences, um, you know, again, the residue, um, I'm, I'm trying, again, I'm trying to be quick. So I apologize if it seems a little all over the map, but um, I think the takeaway is trying to create work, reimagine work, reimagine my pedagogy approaches. And, and again, being able to address that that aspect of how we can heal culturally um, and also having you know I will say this having white students look at this as well so again this idea that it's just our work um, as black and brown bodies that the white white bodies need to also look at this work what's living in your bodies um, you know because I think again we tend to hold the weight of doing the work and bearing the the brunt of the healing um, whereas I think it's it's now it's time for, I will say this just flat out, it's time for white folks to really start doing the work and upping um, their understanding of what, again, what, they, what they've gone through and what, again, what's still being passed down. So I say all this to say, um, reflections have been around, again, creative approaches, my methodologies, um, both, and again, my personal work and also as a faculty person um, and bringing those type of conversations honestly and openly um, in the, the communities that I'm engaged with. Um, again, I, I, I know that's super brief uh, <laughs> in a whirlwind. Um, I hope that all makes sense. Um, but yeah, um, and again, Melissa, I apologize. I apologize to everybody that I'm jumping off. But um, thank you so much for all that you do. Um, and I would love to um, continue engage in conversation with all of you at some point. I'm, I'm excited by what I- Well, we're not done. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> like, I just don't want to come back. Um, but yeah, so, but I have a production meeting waiting for me. So um, I will share more with you as we progress. Thank, well, thank you, you so all much. so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brenda. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Wow, such beautiful work. I invite you all to uh, visit Bridget's website, Be Done Movement. It's amazing beautiful work all about uh, our history and, and processing it through movement. Um, it's, it's amazing how the arts come to our rescue, right? Lia, what are your thoughts? Oui. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, the academic part in this year, because um, I'm a teacher as well, um, brought up a lot of things that we need to address as teachers and as the kind of people that we are redirecting our students into a better world. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this pandemic has what I called came to, as I said before, redirect our lives. Mm -hmm. It has unveiled, um, it has, it has made us discover that we had cataracts, that we had glaucoma, <laughs> that we had all kind of, a the visual diseases that made our vision 2020 and that we need to think out of the box now and to make change, major changes because now it's not only what we do for others, but we got to start looking inside of each one of us. It's not only the Caucasian who has to, uh, they have to, to see and, and, and learn, to unlearn what they have learned, but we as well have to embrace our reality and we have to start putting ourselves out there on a stand, making sure that we are aware 
of what we are, right? And, and, and teaching and showing the rest of the world who we are and what we are worth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, I, 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 I speak to my students every day, now on vacation, but you know, I, I've been educating them on my, on my page with all the information that they need. Um, by the way, happy Kwanzaa, because we are in Kwanzaa right now. What? So right now we're talking about that. And, and we have such a, we have a lot of work to get done, mm -hmm. but thank God. And, and I know it's going to sound, you know, bad in a sense because we have lost a lot of loved ones, mm -hmm. but again, it has came to open up our eyes and to take us out of the, the commodity of the of, of that zone where we were comforting to expose us to new things and to make sure that we are aware that we need to make a change. So I that is my that is my reflection on this year. And I hope that we all we all can see that and we all can join in together as a community in order to make those changes happen because mm -hmm. we need to make it happen. Yes, yes. Wow, thank you for that. And you make such a strong point. We all need to go inside um, because everybody in the world, you know, we, we, we inherit narratives. So not just the oppressed inheriting narratives, but also uh, people in, in the community of the oppressor, you know, and, and I am thankful for all uh, who, who choose to, to let this time be a prompt to investigate. Uh, we've talked so much about allies, the work of allies who are truly committed to looking into their own history and, okay, what have I been doing unconsciously in the world? Mm -hmm. We've all been doing unconscious stuff, the oppressed and people who are in the community of the oppressor. People don't, don't always know what they're doing. We don't always know what we're doing. So this is all an invitation. And, and so I, I yeah, those, those words we hear right on point. Pastor Salt, uh, it was said during this video that we watched that this is quite a spiritual time, an invitation. And I know you have words on that. Good day, everybody. Um, let me first and foremost say, Habarigani. I uh, hope that uh, you all are having a blessed Kwanzaa and uh, allowing those seven principles. We are on day three today to just, you know, envelop you as you, uh, you know, engage in Sankofa, looking back and looking forward. Mm -hmm. So um, that's certainly what it's inviting me into. And so uh, I'm glad to be here. I want to apologize for joining a little late. <clears throat> um, I actually left the uh, previous meeting. Uh, I stayed there longer than I anticipated. No uh, worries. But uh, it was, you know, in, um, in yeah, Baptist, another. In fact, uh, we have a saying, it's never too late for a joyful occasion. So you're here when you have to be here. Yes, exactly. I like that. I yeah. like that. I'm going to have to quote that. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, so good to be with all of you, a beautiful people. It's just good to see all of you uh, on here and um, glad to always be with uh, uh, Melissa, with Maritza and, you know, all the crew uh, from um, the International Society of Black Latinos mm -hmm. um, and uh, just, uh, just a joy uh, to, to be with you. Yes, I mean, 2020, you know, um, uh, has been a year when we... Um, uh, as a person of faith, we've really had to come to terms, I believe, with the, um, um, the spiritual impact of, you know, uh, white nationalism 
and um, and really come to terms with uh, the glacier that moved the tip of the iceberg, which in so many ways, uh, that tip of the iceberg is uh, Trumpism. Um, and, and so, you know, that has just been, I think that has invited us uh, into a time of, you know, uh, realization, a time of reckoning, a time of ongoing resistance, mm -hmm. and more importantly, a time of bold reimagination. Um, we have had to realize the preconditions of COVID-19, uh, which has been, you know, uh, all of the racial inequities that has been going on in the United States for years now. Um, and so I think we have to call that. And, um, and so um, it's been a joy for me uh, to have been an integral part uh, of the movement for Black Lives, which is a movement that uh, was birthed, you know, before Black Lives Matter. Uh, it was actually the glacier that, you know, um, I've had the privilege of working with two of the co-founders uh, of Black Lives Matter, even before Black Lives Matter, Patrice. Uh, we've always worked on criminal justice reform in Los Angeles County and uh, Opal uh, Tometi, um, who is second generation Nigerian, uh, we've always worked on the issue around black immigrants and racial justice around that. So, um, uh, and so that's why, you know, I just looked at 2020, a uh, very tumultuous year uh, for uh, realization. And then, you know, it certainly was a year of reckoning, you know, uh, around just the consequences of, uh, in so many ways, the deception, the distraction, the, the, um, uh, and therefore the destruction that uh, was caused by, you know, uh, white nationalism as both an ideology and as a theology. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we, we want to leave out the fact that there is spiritual and or theological grounding around white nationalism you know, uh, uh, there is. And I think we just have to realize it. Sometimes I call it white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know, uh, theology. You mm -hmm. see that um, that was at the, at the beginning of uh, arrival of white settlers in the United States, as well as in my, the land of my birth, South Africa, which has a similar historical trajectory than what's been going on, you know, uh, over here. Uh, I mentioned the third one, which is resistance. And what's going on right now, really, we must uh, uh, call it what it is. It is, a, it is about spiritual resistance, uh, 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 righteous resistance. That's what's going on. Um, and and we, 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 that's, the, that's the depth and the breadth that our resistance must uh, involve uh, because, you know, that's what will inform the social and political you know, um, resistance that, that needs to take place. And so we've, we, we're entering a new season, but we have to realize that it doesn't mean, you know, uh, just because we have uh, um, uh, the season now of, you know, uh, of Biden Kamala, you know, coming in, um, that we've now reached our destination. That's the mistake we made with Barack Obama, right? Uh, uh, this new season we're entering in, let me submit to you, is nearly the door for us to uh, stay on the battlefield and keep on fighting. It is not our destination. This is just a door. We now have allies or what I would call accomplices, right, uh, in the highest office of the land that has really embraced the whole, you know, equity, not just language but also uh, the equity vision, you know, uh, for the United States. And if you look at what's happening around the, uh, uh, the cabinet that's being put together, it's more than just diversity. Uh, it is also competency. We have to look at that as well. I, I'm, diversity for me is a given. It ain't a goal anymore. If somebody comes to me and tells me diversity is a goal, I'm like, no, you are way out of date right now. I mean, that's just, we passed that now. Right, it is a given. 
Uh, if you are not down with diversity and connected with competency, uh, then whatever you're doing uh, could be an exercise in futility, you know, uh, around it. So, so the key piece is, you know, just the unapologetic embrace that, you know, uh, a beloved community must be characterized by greater inclusivity, greater equality, and greater equity. Uh, there is no other way uh, to have or to experience genuine peace, you know, around that. Then, of course, it, it, it has to do with reimagination. You know, uh, I've always said that in my experience as a Black South African, that pain, you know, uh, is a path to new possibility you know, uh, because it invites us, you know, uh, into reimagination. When I read, you know, what our, um, um, you know, our Haitian, you know, uh, um, um, liberation fighters, you know, uh, have done our South African uh, liberation fighters, our liberation uh, fighters in the United States, they did not allow whatever pain they were going through, you know, uh, as a dead end. They, 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 they embraced it as a detour, but they never lost sight of their North Star, right? You know, in terms of that. So the pain that we've gone through, I believe, has birthed in us as a people the opportunity to reimagine a brand new world. And that's where we're at right now. It is, it has to be a brand new world. Um, mm -hmm. And to see how love can be just as contagious as COVID-19. Hope can just be as contagious as COVID-19. <laughs> Joy, justice, equity, equality, inclusivity, and all that beloved community stands for can just be as you know, uh, contagious, if not even more contagious, yes. you know, uh, as what we are dealing with right now. So, so Melissa, thanks for the opportunity to you know, be part of the, uh, the conversation we've had and this conversation as we continue, you know, uh, to see how we can engage in sacred resistance uh, and, you know, a reimagination, you know, for a more just and a more fair society. So looking forward to not just the conversations, but the collaborations that will emerge uh, out of our journey together. Amen. Thank you for that, Pastor Saul. Mm -hmm. Carla, I know that uh, time is short uh, for, for some of us because there's different schedules we're juggling. Uh, a last word from you, Carla? <laughs> Usher us into 2021. <laughs> Usher us. Well, I tell you, there is no holes bar in 2021. I, I really believe that there is lots of opportunity. I hope that we we take advantage of the things that are intuitively in us. Yes. You know, whether I believe in God, so it's what God speaks and what comes, um, and we follow through because there's power in that, there's purpose in that, and there's provision in that. So that's how I will leave you and <laughs> take you in 2021. Amen. Love you all. Thank you. It's such an honor. God bless, <laughs> Melissa. Uh, please keep in touch. Um, you can reach me. I'm sure Melissa will probably, hopefully, send some information out Absolutely. to all of us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be well, Carla. Bye-bye. You as well. Okay. I would love to hear your, your lovely words of wisdom on what you've gleaned from this year and how you would uh, usher us into 2021. <laughs> oh, it's muted. It's muted. It's, it's muted. Okay, we can't hear you. <laughs> Let's see. There. Can I get it? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, well, anyhow, I, I'm not the go-to person, but I do have some thoughts. And I really appreciated uh, uh, listening to people. And, and really, one, uh, that's one of my goals, to really listen more. Sometimes you get in situations, everybody needs to talk. You want to talk. But to really, it's been a real um, good thing. Um, start for me to be listening to what people are saying and very excited because 
Uh, I see some people were thinking the same thing I was thinking. It's not just me. Uh, one of the things that I have been thinking about this year is our complicity, because I looked at my complicity in what issues and problems I have, and I really, I, I to the point that I looked at Trump, and I had to say, how am I like that? Mm. And and everybody, you know, naturally say, I'm nothing like that. I don't do that. I don't. Uh, uh, uh. Watch yourself. So I was able to identify some things uh, when I went my way on how I operate. And um, it was, you know, it wasn't a, it, it's not a um, uh, good or bad. It's just like, is this who you choose to be? And some things I had to say, no, I don't choose to be that anymore. Uh, the other thing that I felt that was happening is that we got in a, uh, what do you call that kind of bag that it's all mixed up, I don't know, where we actually tried to prove that we were as good as white people. And uh, we set the bar too low um, in that um, we should not be trying to please any other people, to just try to please God. And so that has been, that's made my life simpler. Mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, people will change. God won't. So if I'm pleasing God, I know I'm on track. And um, so that, that that works better for me. Um, yeah, so th those, those I, I don't know, that was my big thing. Because all I, I just feel like a lot of energy has been placed on distractions. When mm -hmm. I listen to the news, I hear a lot about everything else except for the initial reason why we're there. And then I, I had something to come up that was over $4,000 than I thought it should have been today. And I really took this opportunity, rather than the fuss about this and that and this and that, what do you got to do? And the focus was on that. Not that I shouldn't have done that. I should have done this. I should. We're, it's the move forward. Because too much time is spent on things. They're distractions. They really are. So that's, I've been trying to focus on not being so distracted. <laughs> that is an important an important insight, and I thank you for reminding us of this, okay? Go into 2021 more focused, mm -hmm. more focused. Thank you for that. Susan, I know that uh, time is short for you, so please uh, share your, your thoughts. Need mm -hmm. girls? <laughs> oh, I don't know how pearly we'll be, but I will share my thoughts. Thank you. I, there's so many new faces on here and there's some familiar faces on here. So I'm, I'm grateful to be part of this community. So thank each and every one of you and for the shares that I've heard. And I will go back and listen to this again because I missed the beginning of this. Um, I just want to thank you. So I think 2020 has shown me have you guys heard the expression, Yana? Sometimes people put that on. It means you are not alone. And I think if anything, um, this definitely turned up the volume on that for me as mm. far as collaboration and how we really need each other. We, like even in a community, even to have a place where we can have this conversation right now mm -hmm. is so important. Um, I wear a lot of different hats. I am a therapist, but I'm also a, uh, a supervisor. I'm also a mentor for pre-licensed marriage and family therapists. And it wasn't, this year, what surprised me, it wasn't my clients that were, yes, they're having some difficulties and some adjustments, but it was coworkers. It was the people I supervise. It was other therapists that are peer to peer, other colleagues that we really needed to get together and have some safe spaces and have places to be able to say, you are not alone. Yes. 
Me too. Mm -hmm. And then not in the Me Too movement, but like what you're experiencing, me too. Mm -hmm. Things like I'm exhausted all the time, me too. Yeah. Things like I'm not working at the capacity that I was working at before. I should be doing more. Me too. <laughs> and, and since I've been hearing this, I've been in many different spaces. I'm going, oh, this conversation, everybody's having it. But everybody thinks they're having it by themselves. Right. right. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's okay to not be okay. Mm. And, and as therapists and as therapists of color, in the middle of the Black Lives, in the middle of the George Floyd, you know, I I had to take a few days to step up and say, whoa, 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 whoa. I have to center me first mm -hmm. before I can go and help center all these other people who are looking to me for guidance. Yes. That included boundaries. That included, even with my beloved, beautiful allies, to be able to say, I cannot have this conversation with you at this time. Mm -hmm. I might need a, a few weeks. I'm gonna give you some resources if you're sincere about um, learning about white fragility or learning about other things. And I literally had a email sheet of about 50 resources. If you're serious, you'll read these books, you'll watch these videos, you'll watch this documentary. And in time, when I feel like I'm ready to have a, a conversation without being, without my trauma body being triggered, then we can have it or not. And it's been interesting to watch those conversations too. And I think somebody alluded to that a little bit earlier. So 2021 was um, also a year of boundaries mm -hmm. because I didn't have capacity. And I noticed, wow, my, some of my coworkers, they don't have capacity. Other therapists have capacity because we're still human. We have lives. Marriages are falling apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Friendships are falling apart. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff's going on for a lot of people who are also healers. There, we heal. We are healers, and and we also have to heal ourselves. And so, 2021, I've really leaned into these kinds of groups, these kinds of conversations, with other people who are holding similar spaces in many different areas, wearing many different hats. Mm -hmm. There are many ways that we heal, but one of the things that I know for sure is that we heal in community. Mm -hmm. People of color heal in community. Mm -hmm. So I'm often reminded of that song that um, Kirk Franklin has, I need you to survive. Mm -hmm. I, I need each and every one of you to survive. I need each and every one of you to, and I, that's not just physically, I need you to mentally mm -hmm survive. Mm -hmm. I need you to, when we fall off, when we fall down, I need you to stand back up. I'll help you stand back up. I'll hold you up for a little while. But I need you to survive. And I hope that each and every one is available for me when I'm, I need somebody to say, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Me too. Mm -hmm. And I got you. Yes. So if nothing else, 2020, has helped me to let go of guards and learn to rely on my brothers and sisters who are here in the, in the I don't know if I, I would say in the struggle, it, it is a struggle, but it's an inner fight yeah. that are willing to stand with me. And so I, I just wanna, blessings to all of you. Habari Ghani, I do, I do do Kwanzaa and it's a beautiful, and, and, and to look at these, I think this year I'm looking at the, each principle, spending a lot more meditative time in each principle mm. like really how does this look in my life really yeah. how am i showing up for my community with each principle of each day yes yeah. and so i just want to thank you and thank you melissa for for being an outrageously delicious teacher professor <laughs> therapist sister friend everything yeah. that you are <laughs> I love you. finding ways to keep us together in a yeah. delicious I love you for that and thank you so I love much. You too. I love you too and I'm thankful that we have such a strong family of clinicians. We're passionate about this and yes, I think 
everyone has had their experience of tiredness this year. And I'm with you in that it has been rougher than I have ever experienced in my 20 something years as a therapist. This year has been the roughest year to be a therapist. Mm. This has been rough. This has been rough. So I thank you for bringing that up and, and for opening your arms to our colleagues. Uh, you know, we're trying to be there for people to learn to tap into their strengths. And yet our strengths were challenged this year. And I want to tell you that having this series was one very significant way of um, helping myself stay up, helping my helping myself uh, replenish strength because it's been a a draining year in in so many ways so many ways. Here's another Pacific Oaks family member that I, 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 I want to invite your voice into this, William. William, William has, uh, in, in our work together, uh, made it very clear how important the arts are in allowing us to go deeply into these narratives. You know, the arts, as well as clinical work go hand in hand. And we've had some pretty profound conversations about how um, narratives get transmitted from one generation to the other for absolutely all of us, including life as a white person. And the, 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 the pricelessness of of uh, um, allowing ourselves to open our eyes to the back to the backstory to the backstory. Uh, what ha what have been your reflections, William, about what this year brought, and 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 what's moving you into twenty twenty one? Great question. Um, well, first of all, Melissa, thank you so much. Um, for organizing this, for getting us all together and, um, and bringing together our thoughts and it feels like our hearts too uh, at this very difficult time. Uh, major props to you. Uh, also to echo what um, I, I think Blaine was saying in the video clip earlier, um, it is an honor and is very humbling to be invited and included among such a wonderful group of intelligent, strong women. Thank you, it means a lot. Mm -hmm. To talk about 2020, to talk about racism, to talk about Black Lives Matter and everything that we have, we have witnessed and experienced over these extraordinarily uh, difficult but insightful as well uh, last several months. I have a lot of thoughts. Mm -hmm. I probably can't sum it all up perfectly in just a few words, but I will say that, um, begin to echo what Bridget was saying earlier, uh, absolutely, white people owe it, at the very least, to step up to the plate more and own the responsibility that we have in shaping this cruel history that has, has perpetuated this country for so long. Racism must end. And this year has given us a lot of cause to look very hardly at what exactly that need that that means and how to bring that about. As a clinician, it is my job to understand other people's pain, people who I do not have a lot of in common with. And that's, you know, that impresses upon me every day. Uh, although I cannot claim to have experienced or know the pain that Black America has felt and, and carries. It is, it is my job to empathize and it is my privilege as well as um, and my joy uh, to be able to feel what I can peripherally. We, we owe it to ourselves to be better than this. I think that where 
where white culture is concerned, where white Americans, uh, what they owe to the future of this movement and the future of this country is, you know, to, to stop expecting blacks, black people to heal on their own. We owe it to this country to be more active in the narrative, to be more active in the healing process and to understand, as I think uh, Kay was saying earlier, to understand ourselves and really look hard at the ways that we may even subconsciously uh, be doing more harm than good. I think that by beginning to talk about, beginning to make it comfortable for, for, um, for white Americans to, to talk about ways that they feel they may have seen other whites or white people or themselves acted racist or acted uh, discriminatory at some point in their lives is a good starting point. I think facilitating and, and making it um, public acceptable to be vulnerable in that respect uh, is one first step because as we were talking about earlier, a big part of this has to do with a big part of where hatred comes from is hatred as a mask for as a mask out of fear, because if you take that hatred away, then there is pain. Absolutely, I could not agree with that more. I think that to begin that process, the fear of that pain has to be lessened. But the other thing I will say too, is that education is one of the strongest tools we have against hate, against narrow-minded thinking, against uh, Against, oppress against oppression, and, and super, super props to Leah for, uh, for teaching, for working as a teacher in this time, for continuing to show how powerful knowledge is in shaping the future. I hope that as we begin to reopen schools, as, as we begin to push forward through this difficult period, and as the new administration comes into comes into place and begins to change things. I hope that education, it's as good a time as any for uh, a bit of reform in what we teach about the history of this country, takes priority. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope it with all my heart. And I do, and, and for, my own, for my own part, what I have found is that studying history uh, gives me both perspective and it gives me both solidarity and reassurance that the present and even the future may not be as dark as they can seem like sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's what 2020 has uh, given me. Yeah. Thank you for Thank your you. words. May, may, we, may we go more deeply into history and support each other while we do it because it's not easy to learn deeply about our history, all of our history. Kamika, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was just going to emphasize the, the history part, uh, uh, Melissa, because I think that's right now a so-called point of contention. Right, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, in terms of that, um, but it's not just about history as we know. It's also about the 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 discipline of historicity, mm -hmm. right? how history is being told. Exactly, and, 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 and let's just be clear that how history has been told, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the United States, right, uh, uh, has been you know from a very very uh, selective. Uh, and therefore very, very deceptive way. And I think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a true believer in know the truth for truth leads to freedom, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and deception leads to bondage. And so, uh, and so we are being set free, you know, uh, as we get to know, you know, uh, 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 the truth in terms of moving forward. So I apologize for interrupting, but I just couldn't help but, you know, um, um, connect with what William said, and you picked up on it, Melissa. I'm glad that you that you you share that. That's such an essential piece of of this reflection process. Yeah, and and it was not an interruption. We're moving with the flow here. <laughs> and it was uh, 
a wonderful segue, actually, Pastor, because one of the things that struck me from the conversations that we were looking at in the recordings was this idea that um, we have to have the teachers need to have the tools. I'm a teacher as well. Um, uh, they need to have the tools that are rewritten already um, and put in our hands and then um, to, to be able to test to the new history or the hidden history that people care about more, um, that identifies them as um, culture to be more inclusive is um, a, a huge beginning to that conversation. And I, and I, um, I feel that um, this is the time where educators, myself included, can demand that these books not be uh, written in the same way um, so that so that youth can have a, a, a larger voice. And you know, I have to say when when I went on break, I was I was fortunate enough, a little bit of back history, just a little bit, was um, our school um, allowed our students to guide conversations that um, came out of the BLM movement during the summertime for Ju after Juneteenth and said, we're going to form these social justice committees. And they have been extremely beneficial and the voices of youth have been heard a lot more. Um, but at the end in December, the person who is the lead person, she happened to be white. She said, well, what are you gonna do to stay active during the winter break, think of your action. What are you gonna do? And all I could think of was, I am so exhausted right now. I just need to take a step back for you know a few days mm -hmm. to what was already brought up to self heal mm -hmm. to, because I, I was um, in the throat of a lot of different conversations um, because of where we were. Uh, on Zoom um, that allowed opportunities um, that I'd never had before to have conversations with people across the country that I've never had before um, and to expand conversation. So uh, yeah, I really needed to take this time to say, uh, <laughs> I need a little bit of time for myself because of, of this fatigue that I was feeling um, from, from um, helping others um, gain their voice. And, um, and I think one of my, um, uh, so my, my practice of course became from theatrical to cinematic, everything you do on Zoom, everything that you're seeing right now is a cinematic process, um, which meant that everybody is exhausted by taking in information, just the technology in order to make something happen in a different way, um, no matter who you are. Um, that that learning curve was very high for everyone. And yes. the youth were, I mean, they're just, it, I can't even express how exhausted they are. Um, and um, um, to, to be able to learn and to be able to have their voices heard. So, I mean, that's where, that's where I have been this, this uh, I guess this fall um, is to really help students write their monologue that's different in order to then combine their monologues to see where they can help each other, to see where um, their voices can gel um, and where there are differences mm -hmm. and, and allow all voices to be heard in some way 
um, not to acknowledge, oh, this is equality, look at what we're doing. But to say this is the beginning of a, a conversation, I think that now um, what I look at for opportunity is the fact that more people are listening. Um, I, have, I have run into a lot of people, I think it's been mentioned, that are just shocked that they weren't enlightened beforehand. And now they go, oh, oh, I'm just shocked that you never felt that uh, you belonged here. And, you know, and so the, there's an opening, though, and it takes a lot of, I mean, I, I've learned a new level of patience to be able to say, yes, I never felt included here. Um, so what can you do about it? I don't know if I need to do anything other than what I've already been doing, um, but you do need to do something about it. So, um, but there's an opportunity there. There is an openness um, greeting us sometimes that uh, doesn't come out of fear as much as just uh, ignorance, their own dialogue, their own monologue that has stopped them from hearing things and issues from the past. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, I, I guess that's what I, I walk away with 20, from 2021 thinking, I've got to figure out a way to rejuvenate myself mm. um, because where I go for that rejuvenation is closed. Um, like we've all experienced many things, um, they're just closed, whether uh, it's churches, whether, you know, it's the movies, whether it's, you know, gathering. Um, my form of expression behind a mask is completely different now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, so I'm, I'm evaluating that. And um, looking forward to these, these, uh, the opportunities that it is giving me to speak with people like yourselves and um, people across the United States. Yeah. And, um, and there's, you know, uh, really expanding my knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess those are. Those are my um, thoughts, and I'm going to continue to work with youth mostly to um, make sure that they don't have a fear that they um, have to carry the weight. I guess when I'm, when, especially the children who I um, deal with who are white, that the weight of of what their ancestors have done does not stop them from wanting to support and wanting to understand and wanting to um, give back mm -hmm. in a way that um, provides a, a voice for them as well as for the children of color that I, that I work with. Mm -hmm. So um, challenges ahead. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> You know, on, on, on that note uh, about the, the children you work with, uh, it's reminding me of something that was said many times in this series um, about what gives many people a sense of hope is the fact that um, the different forms of protest, the different forms of gaining information about all our history is including uh, more allies um, and that it's heartfelt and while we are responsible for our own healing it definitely is heartening to see people who declare themselves as allies and they mean it that definitely gives a sense of hope and 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 still we know that allies or no allies we are responsible for our healing yeah. maddie i'm dying to hear your voice 
What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for including me in these conversations. I did participate in a few of these um, panels throughout the year. And thank you for inviting me. One of, the things, one of the things I, I thought when you, know, you ask about reflecting in 2020 is I remember when the year was starting, people were talking about 2020, perfect vision. But I think one of the things that people thought is perfect vision is seeing things perfectly, but it's actually perfectly seeing things. They may be good, bad, or ugly. And I think that that's what we saw this year. Ah. I think unfortunately, <laughs> I think unfortunately things like the pandemic happened, but that created stillness that allow a brighter light to shine on the racial injustice and gave people the opportunity to see and to be witness. I think, you know, these are not things that are happening for the first time now, this racial injustice, but because we're always running around buzzing, doing other things, it's kind of like, oh, that's terrible, then move on. But now that we were home or more still, we were, that light was shined upon it and we, we saw it. And like they say, you know, uh, if you didn't know, now you know, you saw it. The one thing is, you know, when people hear say, but now it, you were witness or we were witness. So there was no way of un, unseeing it. And I agree that um, it's very, gives a lot of hope that a lot of the people that were protesting out there were not necessarily the people that were directly affected only. It was collective. Even in countries that a lot of the residents were not even the affected people, they were out there. It was this was definitely a worldwide movement. Um, and I, I've said in a couple of the other um, panels I participated, collaboration is what's gonna move us forward. And I think day after day, we've seen it. Um, either people listening, sharing, having, helping carry the burden and moving this forward ourselves and our community is what's gonna is what's gonna help us in 2021 and for many years to come. Beautifully said, beautifully said. This has uh, really helped us to see what needed to be seen. Mm. And sometimes it's not pretty, but it's there. And, and like, you know, like I said, you didn't know before, now you know. You couldn't see it before, now you saw it. And now that you saw it, what are you gonna do about it? And I think that's what's going through my mind and through hopefully many other people's minds. Yes. And what are you gonna do about it for other people, for the community and for ourselves? Like how can we improve ourselves and make the world, and this sounds corny, but a better place. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. My goodness, this year, how beautifully said, Mighty. This year is calling us to be accountable for our wellness and the wellness of the communities we belong to. And I'm thankful that as difficult as it has been to sit with all of the atrocities that we are now witnessing, uh, for some people witnessing for the first time uh, for people who reluctantly witness, now they're really having to move through the pain of watching. Um, now or never. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. I know. I know. Oh. Sorry, we're going <laughs> Okay, uh, just real quickly, I was going to say, I recall what uh, you once said to us, Melissa, that history has a way of repeating what we need to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff repeats itself constantly, inviting us to respond in a new way. I, I wanted to mention too, I think somebody mentioned about the students, uh, a woman was talking about her students um, uh, that weren't of color. And I, I think the assumption has been that the oppressor does not need healing. And um, being an actor, I always think in terms of being in other people's shoes. And I mean, the idea to grow up that if I was on the other side and these were my people, 
who did this, who are doing this, whose constitution says this, who I'm at home and I know like uh, my father or my husband or my brother is raping, you know, uh, the slave. I, I know you know, you have all of this going on. And then to the housing and you know that your father works at the place that's keeping people from being able to prosper. So you've grown, I mean, it's your culture. It's your culture. So how do you heal from that? And then you see different people sometimes over overdoing it to prove that they're not these evil people and, you know, but there's never been anything to help them through this process. And I know if I see evil, it has a maybe not as great of impact, but it has a great impact than if I were doing it myself, you know. So it's still, I, I don't think that that's been addressed. It's like, well, you're okay. You need to help us. No, they're not okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not okay. Yeah, we all need some profound healing, all of us, oppressed and oppressors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and this is where this is where education plays a very high role, right? In allowing people to manifest their feelings towards everything that has come through, you know, for all these years, not only for our black folks but for also for white folks, because. Everybody needs to heal and everybody needs to understand where the history came, why it happened, and where are we going to make it understanding and better, you know, because they are discovering things now. Things that they really didn't know, things that, that they that or they that they knew and they just didn't want to just stand before it. So, because because it's, it's not easy. It's, it's it's just not easy if if you are a Caucasian hearing all of these atrocities, all of these this 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 narrative that is not okay, and you're saying, "Oh my God, how how can I stand before them now and say, or well, what should I say?" Mm -hmm. They don't even know how to say I'm sorry because they don't know how to process it. This is something that they, they that everybody needs to work on, and this is where again education. I I was told I was going to be an educator, and I said never. <laughs> but God has a beautiful way how to put things in place. So yeah. this has been for me the the most beautiful ride ever, being an educator. Mm -hmm having to investigate to get resources to to learn myself many things that that were taught in school and they were wrongly taught and 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 to discover that uh uh it, it, it didn't go that way mm -hmm. and and then have having myself to teach my student uh uh it wasn't that way mm -hmm. that was his story not my story mm -hmm. That's what you call it, history. History. That's not my story. Now you hear my story because you never heard the other side of the coin, and you need and you need to know it also. What is going to happen after you understand and you process this information? That is the thing. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. I. I have to say. You know, we could we could be here for hours because this is such a layered experience that started not in 2020, um, but centuries ago, and 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 so much of it has become evident in 2020. Thankfully, so I appreciate all of you for the time that you've taken in this year that's been so difficult for all of us in ways that we never expected. And yet you have made space, made time 
to join this conversation and publicly so to invite communities into reflection. There are no words. There's just not enough uh, uh, thanks from me to you for what you have given in the way of your insights, your hopes. And I, I look forward to many more conversations. We have them privately. We have them on this platform. And may we support each other in this healing process that we all need and deserve. May this year be a turning point like no other, as it's been said many times in our multiple conversations. May 2021 be a, a great door to quote Pastor Saul's into more healing. Thank you all. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Muchas much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon. Thanks, everyone. Abrazos. Bye. 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 Happy New Year to everyone. Happy New Year. Year. Thank you. <laughs> Take time to breathe. Yes. yes. Thank Important. You for taking care of yourselves. <laughs>